Right, welcome to the February webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Adam Sabo to our webinar, who will share with us um, the latest from the Parker Solar Probe as it explores the sun. Dr. Adam Sabo is the chief of the Helio Heliospheric uh, Physics Laboratory at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. He serves as the mission scientist for the Parker Solar Probe. He is also the project scientist for the Deep Space Climate Observatory. He specializes in the study of solar wind structures like CMEs and interplanetary shocks and things like that. Uh, lots of excitement, space weather. So please welcome Adam Sabo. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for your interest for the Parker Solar Probe. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. So next, I will start sharing my presentation. Let's see. And let me know if you can see a slide. It looks perfect. Thank you, Adam. Excellent. So, uh, Parker Solar Probe. Let's see if it actually advances for me. Hold on. Here we go. As the name implies, of course, it's a mission to explore the sun. But before I plunge into the details of the mission, I decided to give you guys a one page uh, history lesson on uh, what it takes to get such a mission going. Back in 1958, and okay, at least we didn't have to start with the creation of the world or you know, the Big Bang. Uh, in 1958, as uh, NASA was forming, the National Academy of Sciences commissioned a, a committee called the Simpsons uh, Committee that once we figured out how to launch rockets into the space, the obvious question was raised that, so where should we go once we get into space? And one of their top candidate targets, even back then, was we need to go as close to the sun as possible, definitely well within the orbit of Mercury. In 1962, uh, starting at that time, NASA started seriously to explore the, how to do this. They were eight consecutive uh, major, uh, we call it science and technology definition teams. These are year-long studies where both the science and the technology is assessed and uh, it, an attempt is made that how can we implement such a mission. So for eight times they tried and either they came back that sorry we do not have the technology to do it or even if we might be able to do it it's way too expensive. That changed in 2008 when finally the technology that we needed, namely heat shield technology, miniaturization because we needed a really small satellite and computer technology that enabled autonomous operation of the spacecraft, uh, all became a reality. And at least it became an attemptable mission. It still took 10 years before we had a spacecraft, which by the way, do you guys see my uh, cursor? If I move it around, I have it over the lower right image. Yes, we do. Oh, yeah, we can be, we can see it. Okay, so this is the actual uh, spacecraft that was built by 2018, uh, and to demonstrate to you that indeed it did leave Earth. Here is a video of uh, the launch. It was launched on a Delta IV Heavy the biggest rocket uh, in our inventory. Uh, it was a really, really tiny uh, 600 kilo uh, spacecraft put on the biggest rocket the, uh, to get close to the sun. Uh, it went really fast that uh, we launched in August. By October, we were at Venus. And by November 5th, we were at the first uh, perihelion closest approach uh, to the sun. We did an, uh, three orbits around the sun that we uh, caught up again with Venus that uh, allowed us to get a little bit closer. Uh, we just finished the fourth uh, orbit around the sun. We are waiting for the data coming back. We know that the spacecraft is healthy, but uh, it takes a really long time uh, to, to telemeter back all that data that is collected near the sun. So, uh, 
in this video, the green light shows the orbit of uh, the solar probe. We start, of course, from Earth, and then we get to Venus. And uh, many people ask me as I talk about uh, the Parker Solar Probe, well, why do you need such a big rocket? Just lift up from Earth and fall right into the sun. How hard can it be? Uh, now, most of you as astronomers, you are probably well versed in capillary and mechanics. Uh, so it wouldn't be a surprise to you that it does make a difference that we start from Earth. And so we already have a very hefty orbital velocity around the sun, around 29 kilometers per second. So in order to fall in, what we do with this big rocket, we step on the brakes. So that is, we fire in the opposite direction of the orbital motion to slow the uh, spacecraft down so it can actually fall in. And even with that huge rocket uh, and a tiny mass on top of it, we can barely get closer to the sun than Venus. So we went to Venus and we do their um, uh, inverted uh, gravity assist or reverse gravity assist maneuver in the sense that we in the past used, for example, Jupiter to go by, go behind it and slingshot us out at a faster speed so we can get out to the outer heliosphere. Here we go in front of Venus uh, in order to get slowed down. But even this maneuver is not enough to get us close enough to the sun as close as we want to go, which you see at the bottom of the screen that we really want to get below 10 solar radii. Uh, so one grid, Venus gravity assist only barely took us below 37. So to get closer, we needed to come back to Venus and then get yet another Venus gravity assist and then we get a, a little bit closer. Then we come back and we have to do this seven times to get done to 10 solar radii. So every time we fly by Venus is not only that we want to get closer uh, that, to the sun that is slowed down, but we have to carefully target such a way that either two or three orbits later, we will reacquire Venus again. Remember, we do not carry much fuel. So it's not that we go in and then we just fire our rockets to find Venus again. Uh, we have only enough fuel to orient ourselves for minor corrections. So it is a phenomenally difficult job to target from one encounter to the next, but it has been working very well so far. So on the next, I zoom in to that plot on what was on the upper right hand. Uh, this actually shows the timeline of how far we are from the sun versus the speed. The blue line is the distance we are from the sun. The scale is on the right hand side. And so what you can see is that we have 24 orbits. So like those red uh, numbers on the top indicate the perihelion, the closest approach uh, uh, numbered from 1 to 24. And so you can also see in the blue boxes below that uh, what are the closest distances as we get closer and closer to the sun? So we had first just below 36 solar radii. Uh, with the current one that uh, we are dating the data for, we have now finally below 28. Uh, it will take two more orbits before we get to 20 and so on. And six years later, we will get done to 10 solar radii. By the way, the red curves, so it is the speed of the spacecraft which is really, really fast. So we will be approaching 200 kilometers per second, which by far the fastest man-made object ever. So a couple of uh, curiosity items, I just, if you are in, into these sort of tidbits, uh, at 6.12 million kilometers, Parker will be the closest ever to the sun, the DOIG, that of course was our objective. Before us, the the record holder was a Helios 2, a, a really nifty uh, German uh, spacecraft, a twin actually, the Helios 1 and 2, uh, that uh, got to 43 million kilometers, that is just inside Mercury's orbit in 1976, and lived to survive, uh, talk about it. Uh, on our heat shield, we expect to reach 1300 uh, degrees centigrade uh, and not get burnt up. Uh, as I said, that we will get to really high speeds, and it only took 60 years to get to this point. So, uh, 
Next, I'm going to talk about the instrumentation that uh, we are, of course, we don't just want to get there, we want to make measurements. So the first one that you probably uh, care a lot about uh, is the whisper camera. We cannot take pictures directly at the sun. Uh, there's just too much heat, too much light. It would burn uh, the instrumentation. So what we have, the, this telescope, uh, there are really two of them. They are looking sideways and their objective is to image the solar wind, the charged particles of the expanding uh, corona of the sun sort of evaporating uh, uh, atmosphere of the sun. And we can see the scattered light from, uh, from um, primarily from electrons, actually. I will show pictures just in a moment. I'm just introducing right now the instruments. The next uh, suite is what's called fields. It measures magnetic and electric fields of various uh, frequencies. It has two uh, plug gate magnetometers at the end of the boom, and then a search coil maybe at the very tip. They measure magnetic fields at the different frequency ranges. And it has a, a couple of antennas, so four up front and a tiny little stub in the back that gives a fifth uh, point of measurement. It measures electric and magnetic field variations at uh, much higher frequencies. It enables us to make radio science measurements uh, but also local plasma frequency measurements, uh, which allows us to determine, for example, the local uh, electron density. Next instrument sweep is what we call sweep. They, they uh, again, it's a number of different instruments. They measure the thermal component of the solar wind. Uh, these are the electrons and positive ions that stream away uh, from the sun. Uh, they uh, they can be of various kinds. Uh, they require measurements uh, from both sides of the spacecraft. They have um, detectors on both sides. And then there is one at the tip, which I show you uh, uh, next to the heat shield. I will show you in a later figure. And then finally, but not least, uh, ESIS. Uh, and uh, we, we picked this name. We just thought we were very cute about it way before ISIS was a, a, had a different connotation. We named it after the Egyptian goddess. Uh, so the pronunciation is ISIS, to be clear, and we put that sun sign in the middle. It's energetic particle suite. So this mushroom looking thing measures uh, lower energy particles. Each little uh, sort of looks like uh, cannon uh, uh, barrels. They allow particles to er uh, enter in. And these heftier set of tubes measure the higher energy particles. So that's all we have in terms of instruments. And so on this figure, you can see a little bit better how they are arranged. So here is the whole spacecraft again. By the way, here is the, the Faraday cup, uh, which is part of the thermal ion measurement uh, suite. We are here, which uh, Actually, the problem with the ions is that they are streaming away from the sun. So if we really wanted to measure them, we do have to look at, look at the sun and we had to design an instrument that can withstand that kind of heat and still make measurements. So that's a pretty nifty device by itself too. By the way, this whole spacecraft, so here is the thermal protection system. Uh, there's a heat shield. The actual spacecraft is only this uh, gold blanketed portion, which is about one and a half meter tall and one meter diameter. So it's rather small as far as uh, NASA birds are uh, concerned. Uh, so because we had to limit the mass in order to be able to get uh, close to the sun. Let's see, moving on, that's the backside. Uh, uh, looks the same, except they are different instruments uh, visible. So. Science results. So uh, you, you guys are allowed to ask questions about the technology, but I figured that since we already had three orbits completed, I, I will start summarizing the science accomplishments that we made so far. It's early in the game. We just barely learned how to calibrate our uh, measurements, and some of the measurements, uh, types of measurements, are still not fully calibrated, but we already saw some remarkable stuff. So uh, this is the first light image from the Whisper uh, camera. 
So the sun is this time to the right. And we have two cameras. So the smaller one is looking forward. So the sun is this way. This is the second camera. Well, obviously you will recognize the, the galactic plane and the, the zillion stars. And so it convinced us that a, that we can see something real because we most of us recognize the picture that it's indeed correct. Now, after a little bit of cleaning up the data, here is, uh, unfortunately, I flipped the direction so the sunlight this way. Uh, again, the two cameras taking a picture. This was a unique time during the Venus encounter where we were able to look back. And so this bright thingy is Earth. And that was just a novelty. By the way, it also points out the difficulties of uh, taking this kind of picture. So those of you night astronomers, this line here is what became of Betelgeuse in the Orion. It's elongated uh, from, uh, uh, due to a reflection from a detector mask, so we had to eliminate that. And then you can see a ghost image of Earth appearing there, which again, later pro uh, processing eliminated. But it, it was sort of a neat uh, picture. Now, in terms of more science, uh, then just nice pictures. So after much processing and removing the background, such as stars and galaxy and so on, this is sort of the pictures that we get, what you see in the background. So this is the solar wind streaming away. The sun is obviously to the left and the solar wind is streaming away. And so there are a couple of things that I want to draw your attention to. One of them is, as it starts out in a moment, again, you will see a corona mass ejection, this gravity-like thing. It's, it's a big blowout, an explosion on the, on the sun that is uh, blowing away. And what was very new for us is that if you look behind it, there is lots of turbulence behind it that we didn't expect. Uh, we also see uh, lots of these streaks, and I will come back to that. And first we saw that, well, you know, energetic particles on the CCD device, uh, they, they can cause things, but these, these actually persist uh, for a long time. So our current understanding, most of these are actually dust particles uh, going right by us. But I will come back to that point in a moment. So back to these smaller blobs, uh, we did see a few bigger blobs from Earth. I mean, we have similar white light imagers, heliospheric imagers on other spacecraft, for example, on stereo. Uh, so it's not exactly a new kind of measurement, but taking these pictures from one AU, we can only see relatively larger blobs floating out. Here we could actually track rather small ones. So again, here is the streamer, but the solar wind, the equatorial region. And so uh, conveniently to aid your eye, a green uh, ellipse is drawn where we believe there is a blob and the pink uh, uh, dot is in the middle uh, representing the, the center of it as far as we can tell. So as we move in time, left to right, top to bottom, you can see that it's not only moving out, it's getting fatter. And so we can see a clear evolution of the aspect ratio, uh, which actually is something we were never able to uh, observe in this detail before. So in, in this plot, what I'm showing is the uh, time profile of the aspect ratio that it remains fairly elongated and then whoop, uh, it becomes uh, rather circular later on. So that has some physics there. Something strange happened at that certain uh, altitude or well, time in this plot, but it refers to a certain distance from the sun that uh, different physical processes took place and it allowed the change. So pressure balances uh, were disrupted. So meet first observation. Now, uh, this is on the left. This is actually how one of our inner uh, telescope images look like. If you just download the raw data and then display it, this is what you will get. Uh, the sun is here and everything is dominated by what we call the F corona, which is basically just dust. Uh, well, the light scattering out from uh, dust. So, Careful work has to be done to remove all of that to uh, reveal the cake corona below it. Uh, and of course, even the stars uh, jumping out of it. Now, 
the scientific question here is, we of course always knew and worried about that as we are getting closer to the sun, the dust environment is expected to be more and more intense. And you just heard how fast we are traveling. So it's not a really good idea to get the uh, sort of uh, dust cleaned. Uh, is one way to remove paint, for example, right? The, to throw that much dust at us at high speed and uh, puncture holes all over. So we were uh, worried about- Adam, we ended up with a couple of questions here that I think uh, relate to where you are. So pardon me for interrupting. Um, yeah, go so ahead. Uh, kind of going back to the last one, and so we're delayed just slightly here. And so Jeffrey asked, how fast do the island structures move away from the sun? So if you look at the time on the top, so those are all within the same day. So these are uh, within a couple hours of uh, each other. So that that close to the sun, we typically expect uh, solar wind stuff to move sort of 50 to 100 kilometers per second. And then they speed up as they get further away, which one is one of our uh, objectives to understand that why is the solar wind starting out in the corona at uh, you know leisurely 100 kilometers per second end up ends up running at 400 to 800 or sometimes even 1000 kilometers per second does that answer the question i think so and so here's a, another question that i think is perhaps related to where you are here and so ron asked and i'm going to um add to this a little bit, he asked, what's the closest we can get to the sun with the current technology? And I'm gonna kind of embellish that because it looks like that these uh, uh, images with the island structures and the next one that you're looking at with the dust are relatively close to the sun. And so um, are these things that you're able to image only when you're really close to the sun? And um, we be able to get better data the closer you get to the sun? Yeah, so there are a couple of questions there. How much closer can we get to the sun? We ourselves ask this question because, of course, leave it to the scientists. I mean, the engineers asked us that question. So how close would you like to go to the sun? Uh, we had a couple of ideas on that topic, and they didn't like the answer. So uh, we wanted to go down a minimum of four to five solar radii because that we felt that, that really, uh, uh, that's where the most exciting science is. So we really went as far in. We could have gone a little bit closer just with the uh, uh, orbital mechanics, but uh, it's the temperature that determines how close we can go. So it's not these blobs, the solar wind pressure is uh, completely uh, irrelevant. Light pressure is an order of magnitude uh, larger than anything coming from the solar wind particles. It's really the heat. It's the light and the heat uh, that, puts a limit on how close we can get. Uh, so what's, I mean, there was another question. Yeah, and so we've got, a, we've got a couple of questions here. And, and so when you're talking there about, about the temperature, and so uh, William had a, a, a question earlier and uh, about um, you know, the temperature changes from the interior of the sun into the corona. And of course, the corona is much hotter. And so, uh, what happens to the temperature as you move outwards and then through the corona? And uh, what is the, um, mm -hmm. do you know the cause of the temperature, high temperature in the corona? Or maybe that's what one of the uh, goals of the mission is. Yes, if, if I knew the answer, uh, <laughs> I would be rather famous by now. Uh, it is indeed one of the top uh, priorities and objectives of the mission to try to figure out. It is, if you think about it, it doesn't follow that you look at the photosphere, the visible surface of the sun, and you get uh, four, four and a half thousand uh, Kelvin type of temperature. I mean, yes, we have hotter and cooler portions, but on that, that, that range, then you get a, a one solar radii or two out, and then all of a sudden you have one million degree uh, temperature. So what, uh, what is going on? Uh, and so we, of course, how you can tell that scientists don't know the answer is not that there are no answer, proposed answers, but uh, that we have at least uh, four or five 
possible explanations, uh, all mutually exclusive. So uh, that indicates that we're really not, not sure. We have candidate theories. Uh, the, my favorite one is, the, if you must ask, that uh, uh, waves, electromagnetic waves, as they uh, spread out from the sun, uh, as the density drops, as the solar wind sp uh, spreads out in 3D space and the spherical expansion, it gets into resonance with the waves. And that happens at that uh, altitude. And so the electromagnetic waves can transfer all of the sudden lots of energy to the particle, which then turns into heating. But that, that's just a theory. Uh, there are many others, uh, magnetic reconnection, for example, turbulence. So long list. So, so back to these island structures. And so um, you don't know what they are quite yet. And you're, you're trying to figure out what they are. You don't really, they're, they're just some, a denser part of the, uh, the stream coming out. Is that the yes. current? Yes, so, okay. Idea? Now I remember your question that, so why is it that we only see them uh, with Parker and would we see more later on? Uh, then, so we are seeing uh, reflected or diffracted uh, light. Uh, so from Earth, these uh, closing structures are always sort of head on or uh, very near the sun. So they are not bright, like corona mass ejections, they are really, really huge and bright. So you, you see them fairly well, even from one AU. These little dudes uh, are just, uh, even on these images, are hard to discern. So the only way we can see it is that we have to be next to them looking sideways, which will never ever happen from one AU. So our expectation is that as we get closer and closer, we would see more and more of these structures. So these structures have an implication uh, to the origin of the solar wind. There is a big debate going on to one of our other questions that how does the solar wind come, come about? Is it happening that uh, continuously and smoothly, uh, or it, it happens as little jetlets uh, uh, shoot out discontinuously, the gaps between them, and we just see them as uh, morph together soup when we see, uh, observe it far enough from the sun. So if these uh, little blobs are really becoming more and more frequent as we get closer and closer to the sun, it might be implying that they are really, really uh, little explosions that throw out the solar wind at all times. And so it would imply that indeed the solar wind is intermittent rather than continuous. But uh, the jury is still out. Uh, just because we see a few of these, that doesn't mean that everything else is that way, though it might be true. Okay, so um, last question in this little series, you know, th this crowd will keep asking question after question after question. They're great questions, and so sometimes we have to, but I'm going to, you know, ask this one because it's a really good one. Um, and so J.A. is uh, uh, thinking about the geometry of where the cameras are pointing when you're looking at this imagery, and he says that um, you can't point them directly at the sun, and so he's wondering about um, the structures that you're seeing, the CME that you saw actually passing. Um, and so kind of where are you pointing um, with, with the camera in relationship to um, where the sun is? And so, how far out from the sun are you um, looking at these uh, structures? Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we really cannot look anywhere near the sun because it would melt our uh, optics. So we are looking sideways. And so then we started to do some hard searching that, okay, I can point, well, 360 degrees perpendicular the direction to the sun. So where should I be point? And so obviously we want to point in the ecliptic because that's where the slower and denser solar wind is. That's where we can see structures. Uh, that, then we still have two choices. We can point forward or backwards. Uh, the backwards direction had the, uh, speaking for it, that uh, it's safer because the front is where the dusting, the uh, the dust spray happens because we are moving forward, all the dust particle hit there. Uh, optics doesn't really like uh, a whole lot of dust particles hitting it. 
so uh, that would have been much safer to look backwards. But we decided to go with the forward one because this way we actually see what we will uh, what, uh, fly through uh, uh, typically in a few minutes or in an hour. So first we image it and then the in-situ instruments measure it. So we sort of like the idea, it's sort of like you, you turn on your headlight in fog and then you see blobs coming at you. And so, you know, a couple of seconds ahead of time, what is it, the, what blob you hit uh, with your car. So that decided uh, that we look forward and we just took the risk and so far it paid off. Okay. All right, perfect, thank you. So back to the DOS uh, to finish this up. So uh, back in 1929, uh, it was uh, postulated that uh, dust particles cannot really survive very close to the sun because, well, it gets really hot there and the light pressure would, even if they don't evaporate, the light pressure would push them right out so that there should be a dust-free zone inside four or five solar radii. Uh, this could not, have, could not be uh, substantiated till now. So what I'm showing on the right is a, a curve where you take uh, a cut through the center of this image and then you just uh, from closest to the sun as close as we can get and by the way that changes as we get closer to the sun so it's not a constant distance from the sun uh, all the way out and uh, uh, just plot this so the different curves uh, refer to different times uh, therefore different distances so we started at 71 solar ABI all the way down to 36 and so those are the different curves and this the dashed line is what you would expect to see if uh, there is just a, a constant increase as you would have one over r square increase uh, of uh, of the dust density as you are getting closer to the sun and what was noticed that uh, as we are getting closer and closer to the sun there is deviation on the inner edge it's not quite as bright as it should be it's still brighter than before but not as much as we expected. So some interpret this that we are starting to see the end of the fog. We are still in it, <coughs> excuse me. We are still in it, but uh, uh, we can sort of sense that uh, it's clearing up ahead. So that's an intriguing hint that indeed there might be a dust-free zone. Now, I told you that I will come back to these tricks. So this is, uh, a single image where we have quite a number of these tricks. So uh, first of all, are they energetic particle hits? And we know that uh, energetic particles, uh, when they hit CCDs, they show up as bright light, uh, but they show up as single dots. These are streaks. And so th during the integration time of this image, uh, they moved, but not, that means they move really slowly. Uh, the spacecraft is moving at this point close to 100 kilometers per second. These uh, particles move relative to the spacecraft a few centimeters a second. So somehow these particles know how to uh, match up their speed uh, to the spacecraft. Now, how is that possible? So then we notice that if you look at these lines, they are not parallel. They are, if you take them back outside of the image, uh, they seem to have a single focus point, most of them. And so then the engineers looked at us and said, well, we can make a couple of assumptions how far away, da, da, da. Uh, and they said, oh, wait a moment, that the focal point is the heat shield uh, up front. So our understanding is that as dust particles hit our carbon-carbon fiber uh, and sandwiched heat shield, it sheds uh, uh, slow-moving particles, well, slow, relative to the sun, I mean, relative to the solar wind, uh, uh, those are basically the explosion when a dust particle hits the heat shield and we see the debris field moving away. So that terrified the engineers as a wait a moment. Uh, how long do we have before we lose the whole heat shield? So then you count up these particles. These are single molecules. 
So then I think uh, we added up that even the, at worst case scenario, we have over 100 years before the heat shield is gone. So we can afford to lose this many particles, but it's sort of uh, scary at times. All right, switching slightly a topic, uh, moving into the in-situ uh, world. Uh, if we look at the sun, and uh, I've mapped out the surface of the sun hole over here, is the is like an Earth map, the whole surface wrapped around the sun, pole to pole, uh, 60 degree to 60 degree in this particular case. So this is a map of the surface of the sun. The black and gray or darker or lighter gray area is the magnetic field orientation as we know from, for example, ground observations. And then the colorful area is uh, what models tell us that, well, this is where the solar wind is coming from. Now, most of the sun at low latitude has closed magnetic field loops. So particles that take off somewhere in the middle, well, they will go around on a loop and come back down on the other side. They will not leave the sun. They will come back down to the surface. So the only way particles can come out is that in the polar regions, uh, they open up and the particles can stream out. And there are an, a few coronal holes, as we call them, at low latitudes that come and go. Now here is the projection of the orbit of Parker Solar Probe. We were actually sitting, we were going so fast that we actually went faster than the corotational speed. Uh, of the sun for a while. So we were like hovering over this spot for a while, and then we moved uh, on. And these, well, it used to be uh, black lines, it's turned into a solid surface. This is what models predict that from the altitude of Parker Solar Probe, where is the magnetic field, the local magnetic field connected on the surface of the sun? So they map to polar corona holes or to local uh, and uh, corona holes, low latitude corona holes. Now, if we move a little bit further out uh, to five solar radii, and this is what this uh, cartoon is illustrating, if you look at the magnetic field lines from the poles, that's where the particles are streaming out, the, the streaming solar wind stretches out everything. It's called the frozen in condition that uh, plasma drags magnetic fields with it and they cannot sort of, uh, they are glued to each other, they cannot get separated. So as the solar wind is flowing out, it stretches out these magnetic field lines, but they are being pushed each against each other. So field lines going away from the sun and back, they are right next to each other without touching, uh, forming a current sheet in between. It's called the heliospheric current sheet. It's sort of the largest coherent structure in the heliosphere that nobody ever heard of. Uh, so it's five solar radii. The models predict that uh, this is where this wavy current sheet is. And this is, again, the projection of the solar probe orbit. And that uh, told us that during the encounter, we were in the southern polar region. So the the magnetic field lines were expected to largely point toward the sun. So that was the prediction. So let's look at what we actually measured. So here are actual field and plasma measurements from the first encounter. It covers the basically the full encounter uh, region that when we are close to the sun, uh, you can see the distance uh, in AU, so we are starting here just above Mercury at 0.36 uh, AUs, get down to uh, perihelion and go back out to pretty much the same uh, distance. So on the top is the magnetic field strength. This is just the scalar strength. So obviously, as we get closer to the sun, not surprisingly, the magnetic field strength goes up. No surprise there. There were, by the way, we observed two corona mass ejections, which you know, stick out like a third sun. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't see any during the closest approach, which would have been really nice. But these were nice anyways, hopefully next time around. Uh, this is the radio component of the magnetic field. And as predicted, we are mostly in the negative direction. In the radial, of course, is positive away from the sun and negative back toward the sun. So the predictions, like, by and large, the, the accurate. Next one is the speed of the uh, uh, solar wind. 
And here we didn't expect to see uh, any increase because once the speed, then the solar wind is going, well, that's its speed. It's not going to change as it's streaming away significantly. It does if you look at it all the way to Voyager, but not at this distance. By the way, this increased hash is just an artifact of that we switched to higher time resolution. So you can see more hash. So that's not uh, actual real physics. Next is the number density of the protons. And this we did expect to go up and indeed it did. And uh, the temperature uh, of the same protons and there's not much change there. So generally uh, what the physicists expected is well, okay, so that we knew this. So why on earth did we go there? Uh, so the interesting thing right away are these hashes. If we are in the negative magnetic polarity, what are these spikes doing there? Why is the magnetic field every now and then pointing the 180 degrees the wrong direction? And by the way, these correspond to hashes in the, in the velocity tube. So we started to refer to them as switchbacks. So first question, of course, is that are these switchbacks, maybe the heliospheric current sheet is more wavy than we thought that one AU we depicted as like a ballerina skirt in occasion a wrinkle in it, uh, but that's it. Maybe it's um, much more wrinkled up and so we just keep crossing from one side to another. That would explain why the magnetic field changes uh, sign. So to test that, we have luckily uh, supratermal electrons available for, uh, to us. Now, electrons uh, generally match the number of protons and heavier uh, ions so that the plasma remains neutral. But there is a component of the electrons that on the hotter end of things, the supratermal uh, side of things, that they uh, stream only from the sun. They are the only source is the, the corona, and uh, they stream away following the magnetic field lines. They don't come back. So uh, what I am plotting here on the top is the pitch angle distribution of the supertermal electrons. Pitch angle means that we look at their direction relative to the local magnetic field. So zero means that they are streaming uh, along the magnetic field. 180 means that they are going in the opposite direction. Uh, now, most often you don't expect them to be in between because, well, the electrons better follow the highway, the magnetic field line. So either you go one way or the other, but you cannot go perpendicular to it. And indeed, that seems to uh, work out very nicely. So one sign of the heliospheric current sheet crossing is that you change the uh, direction uh, uh, of the magnetic field, but you also change the pitch angle at the same time. So that uh, as you, when the electrons were coming out on, let's say on the top, following, they were going uh, along the magnetic field line. If you really cross the heliospheric current sheet, then uh, when you cross to a magnetic field line going back to the sun, the electrons are still going away from the sun. So all of the sudden they would be contrasting. So we would see a switching uh, of signs. But if there is a kink in the field and it's still just the same field line, the electrons don't get confused. They just follow the magnetic field line. So if we have all these direction changes, which is by the way, these are the angles of the magnetic field is a magnitude uh, again on the top, then we would see that the electrons they even if when they are the magnetic field seems to be oriented back toward the sun uh, they are still just following the magnetic field that is we have not see, uh, uh, crossed the heliospheric current sheet we are in the same polarity so we are not seeing the crossing of the heliospheric current sheet so what are these so those hashes here are blown up uh, in terms of time so it's now 80 minutes rather than uh, several weeks uh, so rather than hashes, now you can see structures. So let's start with panel B, that I am plotting here, the change in velocity that's uh, in blue and the change in the magnetic field, which is in red. 
So as there is a change, so it's basically taking an average so that we can plot them on the same scale. So when we see the magnetic field changing suddenly from one side to another, uh, notice that the velocity does exactly the same thing. Uh, so there is a great correlation and it's, uh, there is such a correlation also, of course, with the uh, tangential and normal components, not just the radial component. So uh, now on top of it, if you look at this red line, which is the magnitude of the magnetic field, you don't see anything there. So that tells us that these changes are rotations. The magnitude does not change, but all the components change. So the only way to do that, if you move the vector, the tip of the vector stays on a sphere. You can change the components whichever way you like, uh, and the magnitude will not change. So these are usually referred to as alternate fluctuations. Uh, so where do they come from? Uh, they last sometimes from a few seconds, maybe a few minutes. Sometimes they have associated density, uh, with the green is density uh, change, sometimes not at all. And so this became a, a all encompassing question because these are all over the place. Now we've seen similar structures at one AU, but uh, very few of them in Ulysses measurement, a couple in the wind measurements. This, uh, Helios had a couple more historically, uh, but not this many. So here is an artist rendition of the switchbacks flowing out. Are they often waves? Are they signatures of magnetic reconnection? Or they are these jets flowing out from the sun? So for example, here is an SDO uh, observation. These are the, uh, you can see the jetlets and each jetlet breaks into even smaller uh, jetlets. Uh, streams flowing away uh, to be see signatures of one of these. Uh, hotly debated topic. Next, uh, in the meanwhile, I'm watching the time. So uh, the next interesting topic, uh, at least for me, is that so we know that the sun's atmosphere correlates uh, with the photos. Adam, can I break in here for a, a quick question that I think might, um, sure. you know, I'm, I'm kind of embellishing. A long time ago, Barry asked, about solar neutrinos, whether they're being studied on this mission. And, and, and it occurred to me that uh, in thinking about this, how the electrons that you're talking about, of course, will respond to the electromagnetic field, the magnetic field around the sun. The neutrinos, of course, won't. Um, but if you were looking at the flux of neutrinos coming from the sun, would that give kind of a check on the electron flow to kind of check in on the, the solar wind that you're doing there to see, uh, you know, what it is that's having the impact. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have day to measure the neutron, uh, neutrino flux. So, so I, don't, I cannot really use that to limit the uh, other measurements. Okay. Does that, well, well, I, that well, well, no, I was just kind of curious. I was thinking about it and, and looking at what you were saying there about the uh, electron flow and the, and the, and the switchbacks with, in there. And I thought, yeah. well, gee, I wonder if the neutrinos might have something um, to inform uh, as kind of a control on that. So, but uh, if you're not measuring them, then you're not measuring them. So uh, also just a kind of a time check, we're down at uh, six minutes uh, before the hour. So just want to yes. give you a time check, so thanks. Yep. So the sun's corrotating atmosphere, we know about it. You take uh, images of like, the solar corona and we can see it's corrotating with uh, the photosphere. It's differentially, so not at the same rate at all, all latitudes, but more or less corrotating. We also know that uh, at one EU, the solar wind is pretty much radial, so it's not corrotating at all. Uh, so somewhere there is a transition. So generally it was un understood that there is an all-fame point, which is a layer. Uh, we started somewhere between 10 and 20 solar radii, and all of a sudden uh, the, the coupling between the solar wind and the photosphere ceases to exist. 
And therefore, the, as you are moving away, of course, you need to apply torque to a particle to keep it uh, corrotating uh, as it's streaming away from the sun. So at that point, it cannot apply torque anymore. So from there on, uh, angular momentum conservation jumps in and uh, you move far enough away and basically the tangential component disappears and it becomes exclusively radial. So what I am plotting down here is the observed velocity in the tangential component of the solar wind. So uh, before we jumped up and down, of course, we said, whoa, it's not radial, it's going minus 50 kilometers per second. Well, yeah, because the spacecraft is moving at 50 kilometers per second. So uh, this is just how we measure it. So one has to, re one has to remove the spacecraft speed. Once we've done that, we get this uh, green curve. And there I would expect that we should be very close to zero. And indeed, when we started, we are very close to zero. And of course, there is variation because it's it's a fairly turbulent uh, medium. So there's up and down and left and right. But uh, on average, I would expect things to be zero. But we notice that at closest approach, there is this systematic uh, tendency for the solar wind to go sideways. But we are nowhere near. Uh, the expected of in point. So what does this really mean? So here on this plot, uh, the different models are shown. So well, first of all, measurements of the transfer speed, the actual corrected uh, transfer speed. So for inbound, uh, first encounter the blue circles and the outbound, uh, the purple squares, and then the second encounter the red and yellow. And so uh, this curve here, uh, the orange curve, is the, is the simple model that, hey, we have corrotation, we know how fast the sun is uh, uh, rotating. So if, we, if it stops corrotating the solar wind at 20 solar radii, and then just allow angular momentum to take its course, this is the, the speed, the tangential speed that the solar wind should have. And so, well, let's see, maybe 25 or 30 solar radii are the, are the right answer. Uh, but the problem is that, well, these curves look very, very different. So not only that, maybe the Austin point is much further out, and that's why we are excited about this current orbit, because we will be done at 26. Uh, uh, so we will be able to rule out the 30, because we will see it. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, but this falls off way too fast. So this would imply that some sort of torque uh, in the negative direction, slowing the solar wind down, but we haven't figured out what physical force uh, would do that. So uh, if I can have two more minutes, uh, just a couple words on energetic particles. We do measure energetic particles. Uh, if you look at the spectrum of the energy of particles coming from the sun, so here's the solar wind. They are done there at a few kilo electron volt range. There are a whole lot of them. Notice this is a log scale, and we are moving from 12 to minus 10, uh, so quite a bit. It's uh, sort of like in astronomy looking at luminosity. Uh, so uh, we have uh, at a higher energy a uh, superthermal tail which every now and then is bumped up by coronal in, uh, uh, interaction regions, impulsive events like flares or SCPs generated by uh, coronal mass ejections. So these are these typical curves. So that's what we are after. Uh, here is uh, the first two orbits, here are the first two orbits of, uh, of solar probe. So here's orbit one and orbit two and uh, uh, energetic particle fluxes are plotted on top of the orbit. So the high energy particles are plotted outward, lower energy particles inward, by the height and the color encoding both uh, the intensity of the measurements. So what we first noticed is that not a whole lot happened, especially when we were near the sun. These are really small, tiny little events. And even small tiny events were <laughs> far and in between. The sun was extremely quiet uh, for the first couple orbits. So we are hoping that it will uh, wake up. 
Now, in terms of exciting the stock, here is the, the, the last slide. Uh, here, here is a, a short time period uh, in the, from the second end counter. The lower energy particles, there's the fluxes measured as a function of time this time, and here is the high energy particles uh, measured in the same time scale. So here is one event where we see a low energy particle event and nothing happening at higher energy. And this is, yeah, we understand this because, of course, whatever accelerated the thermal particles can only accelerate to the lower energies and never made to the high. But then we really had a head scratcher here because, well, we had the high energy particles, but nothing below. So how did they get there? How did they jump across? They obviously had to come from the thermal particles that are even lower energy than these. Uh, they got there, but not here. Uh, so that's a, a real dilemma. So something we will have to look at that uh, magnetic field line connections. Uh, of course, the higher energy particles travel much, much faster than the lower ones. So maybe we had some disconnection. The highway was disrupted, and the the faster ones get to, got to us, but the slower were not. This is just illustrating that even with small events like these, there are plenty of enigmas for us to to look at. So with that, I will close, and uh, uh, I'm open for questions. Yeah, I think that uh, we're a little bit past time, but let's do one last question. And this is from Janet. And I think that this is always a good one. And I think you kind of alluded to it there um, towards the end. And she wants to know about what was most surprising and maybe even what was most exciting about what you've uh, uh, discovered or maybe not discovered so far on the mission. Well, in terms of engineering, we were really, really worried about uh, the dust. We our solar panels are water cooled. Uh, most people would have thought that, well, uh, power generation shouldn't be a problem. If one thing we have plenty of is sunlight. Uh, and it turns out we have too much of it. It's sort of like, I am really thirsty. Here is a fire hydrant, help yourself. Uh, so uh, solar panels tend to melt at that kind of uh, temperature. So the only way we could make uh, uh, solar panels work is that we fold them back, only the very tip uh, stick out into a partial view of the sun. And even then, we had to water cool it. And uh, the water, uh, how do we cool it in space, is that that skirt uh, below the heat shield, that's where the, like a radiator in a car, we circulate the water around and it radiates away the heat and then goes back out cooling the solar panels. So. What is the enemy of a water-cooled system? A punctured hole. Uh, there is no repair shop anywhere nearby. So we were really, really worried about the dust particles. It only takes one to successfully puncture uh, one of the pipes, and then we are pretty much done. So that's one thing that uh, I did, we did not see, and we are very relieved uh, to, that it is so. Uh, for me, uh, this uh, corrotation, is very intriguing. It, if, if we really find that it is indeed further out, this would force us to rewrite textbooks for not just the sun, but uh, astronomy. Uh, in terms of the lifetime of stars, how do we derotate stars? It really is uh, one way to carry away angular momentum with a star is their uh, astral wind or the st stellar wind. Uh, and uh, we had a general understanding, or we thought we had one, that how much angular momentum and how fast can be carried away from a rotating star. Well, if, if indeed the stars know a way to do it more effectively or efficiently than we thought, that would uh, really change the lifetime, uh, how, how long it takes for a, a star to derotate. Now, before you ask the next question, so when would the sun stop spinning? Uh, we still have billions of years to go, so I wouldn't lose sleep over it. And uh, did that answer the question? I think so. So uh, that's really fantastic. And so this is really great. It's such a, an exciting mission to be able to be that close to the sun 
have a spacecraft that was able to be engineered to go that close to the sun, I think that, that it's a marvelous feat that uh, it's returning uh, the science that it is. And uh, we're, we're you know, discovering new stuff that we didn't know was there before. So that's what's really exciting. So, so thank you so much, Adam. We really appreciate your, your joining us this evening. Thank you very much for having me.